it's Sunday night, and we're talking about the doctrine of the devil. When you talk about the doctrine of the devil, you're talking about every false doctrine that's in the Bible. So that actually leaves the other half of the Bible, which is the doctrine of Christ. That's what the Bible is divided into. So whenever you teach on the doctrine of the devil, you're teaching the entire Bible because you have to teach what the doctrine of the devil is not. The doctrine of the devil is in opposition to the doctrine of Christ. Doctrine of Christ. Now, most people will think that the doctrine of the devil is some satanic cult where they draw circles and put a pentagram in the middle of it and light candles on each point of the five points of the pentagram and they kill some chicken and hang it from the ceiling right over the middle of the pentagram and they sit down while the blood drips on them. They think that's the doctrine of the devil. That's Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. That's Goldilocks. That is actually not the doctrine of the devil. The doctrine of the devil is a perversion of the doctrine of Christ. It's where men smooth talk other people. The word devil, daemonion is the word. Some shall depart from the faith and give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of distributing fortunes. That's what the word devil is in that verse. Doctrine of distributing fortunes. And it's amazing that people don't get this. I've had people, somebody wrote me and said, you say that uh, there's no such thing as demons, and I believe there's demons, and, and what about Luke the 8th chapter? And Well, they didn't say what about Luke the 8th chapter. What about the man of the gatherings? They don't know the man of the gatherings is in Luke 8, Mark 5, and Matthew 8. And I've covered that in great detail now. I've been on the doctrine of the devil for about, for about two and a half years on Sunday night. We've covered everything under the sun. You really want to know about it, go back on the Internet, Look at the Doctrine of the Devil series and start watching them. Go as early as you can and watch all the way through. And I cover all of that. That man in the gatherings, he was what we call insane. He was crazy. Now, Jesus never said they had demons. They said they had demons. He always corrected them by, he would change the gender of a word. And the Bible says Jesus rebuked him, A-U-T-O, Auto is our word, A-U-T-O, and automobile is self, self-mobile. Well, that's what Jesus rebuked was self. Distributing fortunes is self. And isn't the love of money the root of all evil? Love of money. I've heard people say, money is the root of all evil. No, the love of money. Love of money is one word. It looks like three words in the English. It's one word in the Greek. It's the word philagoria, P-H-I-L-A-R-G. U R I A. The love of money or the love of distributing fortunes to self is the root of all evil. Love of money is the word philos and augury. Augury uh, means to shine or silver. Now, the only reason people wanted silver or lots of money is so they could shine above others. Philos means an affection. An affection for Money or silver or shining so they can be lifted up above others. And the Bible, Bible says, God resists the proud. Proud is the word, It's There's three words for proud in the Greek text. But when the Bible says God resists the proud, that is the word hupere, H-U-P-E-R-E-P-H-A-N-O-S. That's the word, that is the word uh, resist proud. Resist is the word antitasomai. And that means to make war with, and God is at war with those who are proud, hooper, meaning above, and phanos, meaning to shine. Phanos means to shine. Those who like to shine above others in position, uh, always getting applause, getting awards, wearing some uh, green jacket because you won the Masters, or because, or getting a, a a, a, a Super Bowl, getting a Benson Lombardi trophy because you won the Super Bowl, or getting some badge on you because you sold a million dollars worth of real estate, or getting another uh, award because you're a, a million roundtable sales. It don't matter what it is. Wherever you're shining above others, God doesn't like that. He's at war with those that shine above others. And this word, philogory, means to shine 
I have in a, an affection for shining. Now, that means you want to show off and say, hey, look at me. See my ring, see my car, see my houses, see my stuff, see my position in life. Look how wonderful I am. Isn't that most of the world? Now, we're talking about the doctrine of the devil. That is, there's a word in the Old Testament. It is the word forward. Forward. And forward means to pervert. There's about 12 or 14 words for the word forward. Every one of them means to pervert, to twist, to distort. And when men go into the doctrine of the devil, the Bible says in 1 Timothy 4 and 1, what happens in the latter time, some shall depart from faith, which is death to self, we said this morning, faith is the gospel. Faith is the resurrection. Resurrection is coming to life after dying. And we die daily on a daily cross. Daily cross. And the way you have a daily cross, and the way you die, death means separation, not annihilation. Men will separate themselves from you whenever you tell them truth and live in truth. You can't be a Christian by being nice and keeping your mouth shut. There's no such thing as a nice Christian. Is there? There's no such thing. Because nice is a French word, nisquier. And when you act nice, and people that are nice, they're not nice, they're acting nice. Because nisquier comes from ne, meaning no, no. And skier is our word science. It means knowledge. When a man acts nice, he acts like he doesn't know what's going on and he's playing dumb. That's most of the people in the world. They act like, I'm not a really bad person. I go to some places around here and they got Christian people running these places. I go into one and they're all supposed to be Christian and this woman is running this store and we're all just nice and when I preach to them and leave DVDs with them and they never say a word. It's like, we're nice. We're dumb. You go ahead and say what you want, sir. You're one of our customers and we don't want to make you mad or angry. We don't agree or disagree with nobody. That's okay. That's not Christian. How can you have no knowledge and there's no such thing as a silent witness. I heard Ricky Skaggs say one time, we have a silent witness program in country music. Now how in the world can you be a witness? First of all, a witness is somebody who speaks, isn't it? The word witness is the word martus. Martus. Martus is the word witness. It comes from the word martyr. Martyr. And a martyr is one who dies not for what he don't know, but what he says, what he knows, and what he says. And that's faith, that's the gospel, that's the resurrection, that's dying daily. You can't be a silent witness. That's kind of like saying, I'm a silent martyr. They put me to death. For what? For nothing. I hadn't said anything, hadn't done anything. I've been completely cooperative with everything, and they're going to put me to death as a witness for Christ. There's no such thing. <coughs> now, you have to depart from the faith to get into the doctrine of the devil. The Bible says, in the latter times, some will depart from faith. Apistome. I want you to notice something I just said. You depart from death to self, the gospel, the resurrection daily, because you die daily, and you depart and you give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils to planos. You have to be led away. Led away. This word planos means to follow an imposter who twists God's word. That's what you do. You have to depart from death to self and daily cross. In order to get to the doctrine of the devil, you've got to depart. You cannot have God's doctrine and have the doctrine of the devil at the same time. You're either in, Jesus said, you're either for me or you're against me. There's no, there's no two ways about it. So you get into the doctrine of distributing fortunes, and that's what, isn't that what Kenneth Copeland does? Isn't that what T.D. Jakes does? 
Isn't that what Creflo Dollar does? Isn't that what uh, all these guys, Paul Crouch and all the rest of them, aren't they out there preaching for money? Do you actually think the Baptists are not preaching for money? If they told the truth about bad Baptist doctrine, the London Baptist Confession of 1689, they'd be preaching predestination, death to self, daily cross. But they're preaching a doctrine that's palatable to the world. Probably one of the best, one of my favorite verses concerning this is in Romans 16, 17, where Paul says, Now I beseech you, brethren, to mark them which cause divisions and offenses that are contrary to the doctrines that ye have learned and avoid these people. That word mark is the word scopeo. Mark them, scopeo. We get our word scope from that. A scope on a rifle is you aim at someone or point at them. You point them out, it means to aim at, or to regard and take great heed. Mark them which cause divisions, decostasia. Deco, S-T-A-S-I-A, in the church, Stasis means to stand. Dikos means, means two or to split in half. We get the word die from that or duo. Duo and a duo is two or die is to split something or to divide something. It means there's different doctrines in the church and there should be one. And here's how they do this. These doctrines... They cause divisions and offenses. The word offense is the word scandalon. Scandalon, that is a scandal, what we call a scandal. In a scandalon, the verb form is scandalizo, S K A N D A L I Z O. And a scandalon, that's the same thing as when the Bible speaks of. If a man desire the office of a bishop, let him not be a novice, lest being lifted up in pride he fall into the snare of the devil. Snare. You're not supposed to be new at this. Snare is the word pogus. Has the same basic meaning as a scandal on. That is a little, that's a little sapling that they bend over. They put a little loop around it and they'll come along and they'll trap the little rabbit, pop its leg and make it break its leg or trip it up and it can't do the things that it needs to be doing. And that's what trips up the Christian is being a novice and being unlearned and the way you get led away, the way you get led off into false doctrine is by not knowing the Scriptures. Jesus told the Pharisees, you do err, you do planeo, you do follow imposters and you're led away because you know not the Scriptures. Now, let me finish this. For they that are such, he says, avoid these people. Stay away from them. Eclino. It means to lean away from, go out of your way to stay out of their presence. Those that preach false doctrine. People say, well, the Bible says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. That's with believers. That's not that's with believers in predestination, daily cross, death to self, self denial, Christmas is pagan. You don't hang around unbelievers. Then he says, and avoid these people, get out of their way, it means to shun or go out of your way to keep from associating with them. And he tells you what this doctrine is. For they that are such, those that divide the church and cause offenses and cause the church to stumble, those that are causing divisions in the church, and it's a false doctrine. They that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words, Christologia. Christos, Logos. It sounds plausible. It sounds reasonable. It sounds reasonable. It sounds good to me. If you're not founded in the Word and you listen to some of these preachers, well, it sounds reasonable because you don't even know what they're saying. You don't know how to examine the Word, exegete the Word. You've got to learn the truth to keep from being fooled. 
Then he says, by good words and fair speeches, eulogia. It's, we get our word eulogy from that. Good logos words. Good words, saying real nice smooth words and fair speeches, eulogia, fine speaking, eloquent speaking, $20 words like Hank Hanegraaff uses, like R.C. Sproul uses, and he claims to be a predestinationist, and I'm sure he is. And I'm not saying he's a lost person. I'm saying he's one of the most proud preachers I've ever listened to. Very proud of his doctor's degrees, and he uses all these words that nobody, truck divers, will never understand what he's saying. Or Hank Hanegraaff. And by good words and fair speeches, they deceive the hearts of the simple. Akakos, a.k.a. K-O-S. Innocent. It means people who are not evil yet in their beliefs, and they're uneducated, place the alpha in front of kakos, which means evil or worthless. And they're not at that point. They're just innocent people. That's the people that are fooled by all these false doctrines. I'm not fooled. People get mad at me and say, you're just running down preachers too much. That's because I told a guy just before I come to church, I said, you're ignorant. I said, I don't mean to insult you, but you're ignorant. That means unlearned. And you're sitting here trying to argue with me, and I'm fixing to hang up on you. If you keep on trying to argue me, you don't even know what you're talking about. Now, we're talking about some men who had literally devastated the Bible in the first century. I believe Kenneth Copeland is a false teacher. I believe he teaches the doctor of the devil. And all of those men that call themselves charismatics, whether it's Joyce Myers, she looks like a man, and uh, I think she could whip any truck driver in the house. She looks like she could. Uh, Joyce Myers is a lying false teacher. Billy Graham is a lying false teacher. Charles Stanley is a lying false teacher. Ed Young is a lying false teacher. Anybody who preaches accept Christ, sinners prayer for salvation, and they don't preach that belief is the method of salvation and that belief has to come from God. Belief is the noun, is the verb, and faith is the noun. We're saved by grace through faith. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. If they preach anything other than faith is a gift that God puts in your heart, People say, do you have to believe in predestination to be a believer? You cannot deny it. If you want to sit there and argue and say, I don't believe in, I don't believe in, I believe man's got free will and you argue from now on and you want to argue that predestination is not true and that's some secret meaning to it. It means what it says. Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated before they were born. Now you either believe that or you don't believe God. And how many people believe that? Not many. I'm talking about the greatest liars of the world in the first century was the Pharisees. The Pharisees, Pharisee means separate. That's because they separated themselves and said they were better than everybody else in Israel. The Pharisees were very knowledgeable in the scriptures. The scribes were elite Pharisees. These were the doctors of the law, the lawyers. Not a lawyer like downtown in the Batman building down there. We're not talking about that. We're talking about they were the lawyers of the law. When a scribe or a lawyer were to come to Jesus saying, which is the first and great commandment, they're the same thing. These were the elite Pharisees. That's what they were. They read the scriptures every day. They translated it. They wrote it down constantly. And they're the ones that had polluted the law. Now, when let me go back through it very quickly. When Israel was a nation under kings from 1 Samuel to 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles. They were a nation for 500 years under kings from Saul to Zedekiah, the last king. And God tells them, if you go after other gods and you go after... If you cease to obey my laws, I'll, I'll send four judgments, the sword, the famine, the pestilence. And God kept sending that for 500 years. And, and the last judgment would be the beast. The beast was Babylon, the Babylonian lion. Babylon lion. The Persian mead bear. Mead bear. 
and the Grecian leopard under Alexander the Great, the Grecian Empire leopard, and the last beast with the beast with iron teeth, iron teeth, and that was Rome that devoured these others, Rome. And Rome was ruling during the days of Jesus. And that is the beast. You find that in Daniel 7, in Revelation 13. It's the same thing. It's a world ruling system. It is not a man. And even though the King James text says the, the dragon gave him his power, his seat, and great authority, that's the wrong translation. A-U-T-O-U is the Greek word for him, except it's not him. It has to follow the antecedent that it refers back to all pronouns have antecedents. That's the noun it refers back to. The beast, the beast is Totherion. Totherion. And that is neuter gender. Therefore, all the hymns and the hisses, neuter gender, all the hymns and the hisses have to be neutered. It has to be. The dragon gave it its power, its seed, its great authority because it's still the same beast. The world ruling system is over here. It could be a new world order. It could be a it can be an amalgamation of Roman Catholicism, um, the America, the United Nations, Muslims, all coming together when this thing gets so bad off that it's about to crash and the economy is going down the tubes. Everybody gets together and it will be a phony peace. Well, northern Israel was carried away after going after Baal and Grove and Shemosh and Molech and the list goes on and on and all the gods of the Egyptians and the Zidonians and the gods of Syria and northern Israel was carried away in 722 B.C. Southern Judah was carried away in 586 B.C. I'm going to put this on the board once again because there's some things I want to say. When they get, into, when they get over here, uh, they, they get to Babylon. That's the reason I do it like this is because here's Israel over here Here's Babylon over here. If I had a great big, great big, I'd have Israel over here. I'd have Babylon over here. Babylon is the same thing as Iraq and lower Iraq down here where the Euphrates and the Tigris River come together just before you hit the, the Persian Gulf, uh, about 100 miles or so up the road there. Uh, that's Babylon. They're carrying to Babylon. When the Jews get to Babylon, they have no temple. That has been leveled by Nebuchadnezzar over here. They have no Jerusalem. They have no worship along with the temple. No worship. They're sitting in Babylon. When they get there, they're taken, they're stripped naked, hands are tied behind their back. They end up in Babylon. If they can find a rock to sit at on their fortune, they're imprisoned, but later on, they're released from prison, particularly by the Persians. Babylon is overthrown. Babylon is overthrown by the Persians in 539. And then the Persians are overthrown by Alexander the Great in around 332. And his four generals are subjugated by the Roman Empire. So this is the beast. This is the beast. Well, when they're in Babylon, they don't have any temple, no worship, no Jerusalem, and they're speaking Aramaic over here. They're speaking Aramaic. They were speaking Hebrew over here. Even though Aramaic is a, that is a dialect of the Hebrew, just because you can speak Aramaic don't mean you can understand Hebrew, and most people couldn't. It sounded like a stuttering of the Hebrew. It was like a stammering when you heard them speak it. So they're over here in Babylon. They need a way of worship. You've got to remember, these are unrepentant Israel. The reason they were carried away is because they went after all these idol gods and they never repented of it. When they're in Babylon, they're not repentant. They need a way of worship. They need a law. The law is over here in Hebrew they need to translate it to Aramaic and they need a way of worship. Any way of worship in Babylon, not in Jerusalem, any law they come up with, 
that varies from the law of God, let me say this real clear, will not have God's, God's approval. The synagogue did not have God's approval. They start the synagogue over here. A bunch of unbelieving. You say, I thought they believed in the Bible. I thought they believed in, in the law over here. They twisted the law. These Pharisees or these rabbis in the Babylonian synagogue, these are unrepentant rabbis. Do you understand what I'm saying? They're not godly men. First of all, they never repented of this Baal and Grove worship for 500 years. That's why they were carried away, because they are unrepentant. Well, when they get over here, they said, we'll start this thing, call it synagogue. Comes from soon and I'll go. Meaning to gather together or to assemble together. Is that God's method of worship? No. Because in the synagogue, instead of a high priest, they had a chief rabbi. Rabbi means master or teacher. The Pharisees have never been righteous, not even from the start. Never have, because they began over here in Babylon. Now, the synagogue is not a godly thing because of what it teaches. <clears throat> they started with a rabbi, and they had all these other rabbis that were teachers in the synagogue, but the chief rabbi, they set up a system of teaching called the Halakha and the Haggadah. Now this is the doctrine of the synagogue. Halakha and Haggadah. This is the doctrine of the synagogue out here on West End. It's the doctrine of all synagogues. Is that God's method of worship? No. What did they do in the early, in the ancient world when it came to worshiping God? They would meet, the Jews met in the temple of God, and the Christians met in houses and in caves. And the Christian met, Christians met on the first day of the week long before this Roman Catholic so-called, some say it was a, a Catholic by the name of Sylvester. Maybe it was Sylvester Stallone that changed that, the, the Sabbath into Sunday. The Sabbath was not changed into Sunday, and the Sabbath is not just Saturday. The Sabbath now is Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. That's the Sabbath now. Let me go ahead and say this. It is impossible when Paul would go to the synagogue, when Paul would go to the synagogue on the seventh day, and they were teaching halakha, which was a twisted form of the law. Halakha was a traditionary law, and that's a verbal law. And they said this verbal law was given to Moses on Mount Sinai, and Jesus said, I did not. I was the God on the mountain with Moses. And the Haggadah was a written commentary. It was a written commentary. It could not be spoken aloud, and the Halakha could not be written down. It went through many stages. It went through a midrash stage, which meant story. And then it went through a Mishnah stage. And the Mishnah, the Mishnah was a written commentary on, and it was finally, they said, God said this halakha could not be, could not be written down, and this Haggadah could not be spoken aloud. Now I'm going to ask you a question here in a minute. If that's true, and each rabbi, they had 613 laws, and in these 613 laws, they twisted their meanings of them, 
And Jesus starts out his first message in Matthew, the fifth chapter, correcting, in fact, rebuking the Pharisees when he would say, You have heard that it hath been said. Said is a reference to this halakha. That was the verbal law. It was called a traditionary law or an oral law. Oral law. And it was spoken out loud. And they added all these things to it. And Jesus is correcting them. In Matthew, all the way through the Gospels, he attacks them constantly, attacks the Pharisees. He said, I've heard it hath been said by the Pharisees of old time. He just got through saying, I didn't come to destroy the law and the prophets. He could not possibly be talking about he could not be talking about, you have heard it hath been said by the Levites of old time. Jesus said the law is true, but the law of the Pharisees, this traditionary law, law was called the traditionary law of Moses. The law of Moses is what they had in Israel. This traditionary law, they had added to it and twisted it and perverted it. Now do you think when Paul would go to the synagogue on Saturday, do you think he went there to worship with this pagan, twisted law of God? Not on... Did Paul go to the synagogue to keep the Sabbath on Saturday? No, sir, he didn't. Every time he went to the synagogue, he would preach truth and he would correct them on this law here, and they would become livid, and they would try to kill him and throw him out of town. When he got to the synagogue up here at Antioch, they said, we'll kill you for those words in the 13th and 14th chapter of Acts. We'll kill you! And they run him out of town. And he goes over to a synagogue at Iconium. Why is he going to the synagogue? To keep the Sabbath? Not on your life, he's not. He knows that's where he'll find the Pharisees who've corrupted the Word of God. And every time he goes to a synagogue on the Sabbath, that is to attack the Pharisees who's twisted God's Word. He might as well be going anywhere, going to a bar or a club. He said, I'm down here to correct you. And each time he would preach, they would run him out of town. They would have tarred and feathered him if they could have. They tried to kill him when he left Iconium Synagogue and goes down to Lystra and he gets down to Lystra and these same Pharisees of this synagogue chase him over to Iconium, run him out of town there. He gets down to Lystra. They take these same... It wasn't the people of Lystra that wanted to kill Paul and, and Barnabas. It was the Pharisees who came from this synagogue in Antioch. They come to Iconium, get those people to drive him out, go down to Lystra, get those people, the, the Pharisees of the synagogue over here in Antioch... <coughs> They provoke and they incite the people at Lystra who are pagans to take him outside the city and kill him. It was the words of these Pharisees at Antioch. He didn't go to the synagogue to keep the Sabbath. First of all, the synagogue was an invention of man. It was an invention of these rabbis. And it was a twisting, a forward a forward, perverting, distorting of the Word of God. Do you actually think Paul went to worship with them at the synagogue? No, sir, he didn't. People say they worshiped. Paul worshiped on Saturday. No, he went to attack the Pharisees at the synagogue on Saturday. And we'll get into some of that. He didn't go to keep the, first of all, the synagogue preaches false doctrine. Why would he be why would he go to any synagogue? Synagogue is man made. The temple, which temple we are now, is God instructed. And what's amazing, they said the synagogue of Babylon was more holy than the temple in Jerusalem. They said the verbal law had more power than this law of God written on tables of stone of stone, they said it was more authoritative 
on the mountain when it was given unto Moses. And Moses and Jesus said, I didn't say that. You've heard that it hath been said. That's a direct reference to the halakha. Why in the world would Paul go to a synagogue to worship with a false doctrine? Jesus would go there. Remember at the time of Jesus, you had a temple and you had many synagogues. And the synagogue was, was Babylonian. There's no truth in synagogues. They've twisted the word of God. Wait a minute. I think that's the Baptist church, isn't it? Wait a minute. I think that's the church of Christ. Wait a minute. I think that's the, uh, I think that's the Pentecostals and Charismatics. Oh, they've twisted the word of God. They say tongues is a bunch of jabbering. And I just got through doing a tongues dialectos. And, and glossa means foreign language. And those are the two words. There was a dialect of the corne, the common street language in every city. And when they say that tongues is shanda la manda la shanda la kandai, that is a bunch of hooey. I've taught on the tongues, <laughs> they say, and they'll say, you're being sacrilegious. No, you're going to go to hell if you don't repent. I'm not even going to say sacrilegious because you've twisted the word of God, twisted it all to pieces. You're a Pharisee. One of you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, children of hell, Jesus said. He didn't like them. They have perverted the word of God. They came back to Jerusalem without repentance Said the, said the temple was inferior to the synagogue in Jerusalem and said the verbal law, and Jesus said, I didn't say any of those things. Ain't no way that Paul, well, when did Paul, Paul met twice a week. He went to the synagogue to attack the Jews and he met with the apostles and all new converts on the first day of the week. It was like, it was like walking, going to the synagogue was like going to the meeting place. It was like going to a crack house. It was like going into, going to the synagogue was like going to a place where the mafia meets and going there and preaching to them. That's what it was like. It was like going down in the Ozone Park uh, uh, in New York where that John Gotti's uh, hideout is or that little, whatever it is, little club and standing out in front of there and preaching to them until they're all going to hell. That's what going to synagogue was like because when Paul said these things, they said, we'll get you. Every time he went to synagogue, they ended up throwing him out. And he also met with... He met with the apostles on the first day of the week because that was when Jesus rose from the dead. Pope Sylvester, any of those people, uh, I've got a paper here I run on. Uh, Ellen White, who, is, who was the head of the Seventh-day Adventist, she, they believe that Saturday is the Sabbath. If you believe Saturday is the Sabbath, you're going to have some problems. Because, let me give you something about Sabbath. Uh, this fella wrote some articles about her. Uh, she says the Holy Sabbath looked glorious, a halo of glory all about it. I saw that the Sabbath commandment was not nailed to the cross, but all the other nine commandments were. Huh? Ellen White was about half crazy. She was a Seventh-day Adventist. And you got seventh day worshipers, and uh, the writer here says the this false argument originated with the Adventists. Now the seventh day Adventists were called Millerites. They don't like for you to call them that. But that's what they were. Millerites. They followed a man named Miller in eighteen forty two. This man named Miller said Jesus is coming in 1842. I think he missed that pretty good ways. And then when he didn't come in 1842, he said, I've got to recalculate my figures. He's coming in 1843. Well, he's a year off from what he was then, but he's a long way off, isn't he? Well, out of the Millerites, there were two factions. 
There were some teachers out of the Millerites. They became the Jehovah's Witnesses. And this other segment out of the Millerites became the Seventh-day Adventist. Now, whether you like it or not, Adventist, you are first cousins to Jehovah's Witnesses. Seventh-day Adventist. And that's what they came out of. And, of course, as Jehovah's Witnesses said Jesus was coming back in 1914. And when he didn't come back, they said he came back spiritually. That's a good way to get out of it, isn't it? Now, Ellen White, when you want to send me a book on prophecy, don't send me an Ellen G. White book. She's the head of the Seventh-day Adventist. I don't agree with all of her rituals. In fact, I don't agree with a lot of things she said. Now, let me say some things about the Sabbath. For to se to Seventh-day people, there's some things you need to know. In the Old Testament, let me read to you in Exodus, the 16th chapter. Exodus 16. And I'm saying to you that synagogue worship, Paul going to the synagogue, he did not go to keep the Sabbath. You can't keep the Sabbath where nothing but false doctrine is going on, can you? First of all, on the Sabbath, they had all these sacrifices offered in the temple of God. They were not allowed to offer the sacrifices or do all the rituals of the temple in all these synagogues of the world. They weren't allowed to do that. They all knew that. So how are they going to keep the Sabbath by offering the Sabbath sacrifices? The Bible says in Matthew the 12th chapter that the priests labored all day long on the Sabbath and yet they profaned the Sabbath and were guiltless. They were innocent working on the Sabbath. What was everybody else doing on the Sabbath? Here's the priest in the temple. They're working all day long, offering sacrifices. Here's the, here's the brazen sea. They're washing in the morning. They're offering sacrifices here. Uh, they're going in here and lighting the candlesticks. They're lighting the candlesticks and laying out the showbread, offering incense to God. They're not going into here in the Holy of Holies except one day a year, 10th day of the seventh month for the Day of Atonement. And they're doing all these rituals. And the Bible says they're laboring all day on the Sabbath. They're profaning the Sabbath, and they're, yet they're guiltless. What is everybody else? What is this guy in this house doing over here and this guy over here? What's this guy doing in this house here? and in this house, and this house. And there's a guy in this house way over here, and one up here. What are they doing on the Sabbath? Let's look and see. Go over here to people that are Sabbath day keepers. You're not keeping it the way they were in the Old Testament. You want to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, to keep it kadosh, pure. You have to know what the Sabbath is. Now look here. In Exodus 16, let's look at this. Exodus 16th chapter. And look here in 16. And let's read in verse 22. And it came to pass that on the sixth day they gathered twice as much bread. Remember I said that this morning. They gathered up the mon or the manna, the what is it, out there in the uh, outside the camp. And on the on the sixth day, they gathered twice as much. They couldn't do that any other day. They couldn't keep the bread over till morning. The manna would get wormy, it'd get rotten. God says, I'll supply you daily. You don't have to need to put up any extra. On the sixth day, uh, you can gather twice as much so you have plenty to eat on the Sabbath, which is the seventh day. Sabbath means rest. It doesn't mean seventh. Besides that, you had Sabbath days all through the year. The day of Passover was a Sabbath. The day after Passover was a Sabbath. The seventh day after the Passover was a Sabbath. And that didn't always come on a Saturday. They had high Sabbaths that would land a feast day that land on top of a, 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 a weekly Sabbath. But sometimes it didn't. It landed on a Thursday, a Wednesday. But it was still a Sabbath. Are you going to keep those Sabbaths too? And what does Colossians, the second chapter, say? Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances which was contrary to us, 
took us out of the way, took it out of the way, nailed it to his cross. Therefore, let no man judge you in meats or drinks or Sabbath days or holy days. He's talking to a Gentile church. Don't let anybody tell you you ought to be doing anything on the Sabbath day. That's not true. Now he says in verse, he says, It came to pass that two armors, uh, they gathered twice as much, two armors for one man, and the rulers of the congregation came and told Moses, and he said unto them, This is that which the Lord has said, Tomorrow is the rest, not tomorrow is the, the Sabbath, tomorrow is the rest of the holy Sabbath unto the Lord, Bake that which ye will bake today, and seeth that ye will see that which remaineth over lay up for you to be kept until the morning of the Sabbath day. And they laid it up because they're not allowed to work on the Sabbath, are they? They laid it up till the morning as Moses bade, and it did not stink. Why did he say that? Because the Sabbath morning wouldn't stink when you laid up for the Sabbath on the Friday, which was the day of preparation. That's the day that Jesus died. The Bible says he died on the preparation of the Jews. The Jews' preparation was Friday. He died on Friday. How in the world was in the grave three days and three nights? A part was the whole. Synecdoche. That's why N-E-C-H-D-O-C-H-E a part was the whole. Their day began at 6 o'clock. So 6 o'clock Thursday evening. Thursday evening. Until 6 o'clock Friday evening. What we call Thursday and Friday. What we call Thursday and Friday starts at midnight. Their start at 6 o'clock Thursday evening. Ends up at 6 o'clock Friday evening. Then then the Sabbath begins at 6 o'clock Friday evening. Ends Six o'clock, what we call Saturday evening. That's when the Sabbath ends right here. And then you've got six o'clock Saturday until six o'clock Sunday evening. Now the evening and the morning of the first day, evening being night, they said their day began at six or at sundown, at sundown or somewhere around six o'clock. So if Jesus, and they said, Senect, okay, a part is the whole. Jesus rose from the dead the third day, he didn't raise from the dead any other day. The Bible says repeatedly, he'll raise from the dead the third day. Doesn't it say that over and over? I must rise the third day. That means sometime during the third day, the third day is not going to be a whole. When the Bible says, no sign but the sign of the prophet Jonah three days and three nights, they had no word for day and night. So it was translated that way. They said a part of this was the whole. Jesus rose from the dead Sunday morning. That's the first day of the week. That's why the apostles met on the first day. That's what it says in 1 Corinthians. The apostles, when Paul met with the apostles, he met with them to fellowship, and they had what they called the agape love feast. Agape love feast, and that's what's going on in 1 Corinthians 11th chapter. And that's what Paul is talking about. He's talking about this in 1 Corinthians, the 16th chapter. I'll just read it real quick. Hold your place there in Exodus. Hold your place. 1 Corinthians, the 16th chapter. He says, these are Paul's words. It looks like they're meeting on the first day of the week in 1 Corinthians, the 16th chapter. Paul says... Upon the first day of the week, verse 2, first day is Sunday, isn't it? That's the first day. Sabbath means rest, it doesn't mean seventh. But their seventh day was a day of rest. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings or no offerings when I come. On the first day of the week, that's when they would meet because Jesus rose on the first day. It was early morning on the first day and the tomb was empty. That's why the apostles... This thing precedes the Pope, Pope Sylvester, any other popes. It precedes them back to the time of Jesus. They were meeting on the first day of the week. That's the day he rose from the dead. I don't care what the Pope did. God's Sabbath is every day. 
It's not one day a week. And I'll go in back into that in this series. And then look over here in Acts 20. Paul went to the synagogue on Saturday to rebuke the Pharisees. He went and met at the Agape Love Feast on the first day because that's the day that Jesus rose from the dead. He rose early the first day. So if, if you've got early the first day of the week, he didn't stay in the grave a full 24 hours on that third day. Neither did he stay in a full 24 hours on the first day. If he got into the grave, according to Jewish thought, in their synecdoche, a part being the whole, they had to count. If he got into the grave at 4.30 in the afternoon before sundown, they couldn't count just to sundown. They had to count back to 6 o'clock the next evening by their accounting. You understand what I'm saying? They had to do that on the third day, and he was walking along with two men on the road to Emmaus, and they said, "Not is this not the third day when all these things happen? And he says over and over, I must rise the third day. He didn't rise on the fourth day. If he'd have stayed full three days and three nights in a tomb. How many hours is in three days and three nights? How many hours is in one day and one night? 24. What's three to 24? 72. If he'd have stayed in the grave... 72 hours, three days and three nights, which is three days and three nights. If you stayed in there full 72 hours, which day would he have arisen if he'd have risen one fiftieth of one one hundredth of a second? If he stayed in full three days and three nights, he would have been a fraction of a second into the fourth day, wouldn't he? Right? Huh? He will be risen on the fourth day and the Bible never talks about Jesus rising on the fourth day, does it? He rose the third day. He says that over and over, I must rise the third day. So synecdoche is true. Now where was I? Where are these guys? Paul did not go to the synagogue to worship God. He went there to preach truth to these Pharisees and they wanted to kill him every time he did because the synagogue is man's creation. And it, and it had a twisted doctrine, Halakha and Haggadah, that eventually developed into the Talmud. And the Talmud is so much trash, garbage, but not any different than the Baptist preachers have it twisted the Bible and twisted the Word of God and the Church of Christ and the Pentecostals talking about tongues and faith healing, and there's no such thing. <coughs> We're living in a world of halakha, Pharisees, that have twisted the Word of God. Now let's go back over here. Well, let me give you this in Acts 20. Acts 20, what day did Paul meet on? I got a paper. It's on the Internet. They met, Paul met, at the synagogue to preach to the Jews in this corrupt way of worshiping that was invented in Babylon with a corrupt doctrine. And no way he's going to go to the synagogue to worship God with their pollution. I'm not going to a Baptist church where they preach accept Christ and sinner's prayer for salvation and Christmas and Easter and dip people in water either. If I go up to a Baptist church, it'll be to hammer them and beat them up. With the word of God. That's it's I wish I had the guts. I'll be thrown in jail for it. But Paul going to the synagogue was like me going to the big Baptist church on Sunday morning, walking down the aisle in the middle of it, say, Mister, if you don't change your ways, God will put you in hell. Don't listen to this man. That's what Paul going to the synagogue was like. Don't think he went there to keep the Sabbath. No, he went there to attack the Pharisees. And what did Jesus do? His first message. First, that's why everywhere Paul went, he'd go to the synagogue on Saturday to get him. They'd say, and they, they had a custom among the Jews 
this, if they saw a man with a row bone of the rabbi and they had a little blue lace around the bottom of it and Paul was a Pharisee of the Pharisees and he could wear that robe if he wanted to and he could get people's attention. And they'd say, Rabbi Saul, would you like to come forward and to preach and say a word to us? He said, yes, I would. And he'd get up there and beat them up and they'd say, kill this man, get him out of town. Don't think he went there to worship God. He did not. And look here in Acts 20. Acts 20. Verse 7. Upon the first day of the week, upon Sunday, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached on the first day of the week. The Pope didn't start this. The Pope may have... In the Catholic Church, they say that Sylvester translated the Sabbath to Sunday for the Catholics, not for everyone. Now let's go back over here to Exodus. We're talking about what they did to the Sabbath. What they did, how they polluted everything. Go over here to Exodus, back to Exodus. And we are down to verse 24, I guess. Well, he says, let's read this 23. And he said unto them, This is that which the Lord has said, Tomorrow is the rest of the holy Sabbath unto the Lord. Bake that which you will bake today. You couldn't cook anything on the Sabbath. Now, if you're a Sabbath keeper, what are you doing going to a restaurant on Saturday having somebody else break the Sabbath for you by cooking you a meal? Huh? You can't cook on the Sabbath. You had to cook it on Friday. If you're in Israel, you cook it for Friday. And you had to do three things right before the Sabbath started at 6 o'clock Friday evening, what we call Friday evening. At 6 o'clock or at sundown Friday evening, they had to do three things. They call this the ubric. And the ubric, E-U-B-U-I-C-K, the ubric was you had to Give your tithe before sundown to the priest. You had to prepare your food for the Sabbath because you couldn't cook any food and light no fires. And you had to... What's my next thing? Candles. The candle. You had to light a candle. You could not light any fires or make any lights on the Sabbath, you had to light it before sundown. If you're going to keep the Sabbath, you can't turn any light switches. You can't turn your air conditioner on and off. In fact, Marianne, I believe it was, said this Jew would she'd be walking along the road in New York, long street in New York. This Jew would say, hey, miss, come over here. Come over here. She's going over and going, yeah, what do you need? Turn on my air conditioner. I can't do it because this is the Sabbath. She said, turn it on yourself. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> you see, that's keeping the true Sabbath. You can't do any of these things. I'm not sorry to tell you. If you're a Sabbath keeper, you can't start fires. <laughs> you can't drive your car. What are you doing driving? Sabbath was not a time to go to the temple. They were working there what were these people doing? Let's read it right here. <laughs> and they lay, verse 24, they laid it up, to, up till morning as Moses bade and it did not stink, neither was there any worm therein. And if you kept something overnight on Monday or Tuesday, it would stink and there'd be worms in it. Is that a sign from God? That's another sign, isn't it, from this morning. And Moses said, eat that today, for today is a Sabbath unto the Lord. Today you shall not find it in the field, six days you shall gather it. Only six days was the manna on the ground because they couldn't work on the Sabbath, right? And manna, mom, means what is it? They went out there the first time they saw it in the 16th chapter. In fact, earlier in this chapter, when the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another, it is manna, for they knew not what it was. And manna means, it's the word mon, M-A-W-N, means what is it? And God says that's what we'll call it. What is it? Now, read on with me. 
And Moses said, Eat that today, for today is the Sabbath unto the Lord. Today ye shall not find it in the field. Six days ye shall gather it. But on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, in it there shall be none. Won't be any manna out there. You gather it on Friday, and it will not get wormy that night. God, that's God's miracle. And it came to pass that there went out some of the people on the seventh day for to gather, and they found none. And the Lord said unto Moses, How long refuse ye to keep my commandments? I told you there wouldn't be any out there. Why don't you listen to me? I gave you enough on Friday. If you ate it all up, that's your problem. And my laws, see for that the Lord hath given you the Sabbath. Pay real attention, close attention to what I'm about to say. Here's what these people did over here. People that say they're Sabbath keepers, no you're not. Not if you leave your house. See for that the Lord hath given you the Sabbath, therefore he giveth you on the sixth day the bread for two days, Abide ye every man in his place. Don't go anywhere. This is a day of rest. Let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. You sit in your house. You don't go to church and gather together at the temple. Don't drive your car to a church anywhere. You sit down. Don't cook nothing. Don't turn on any lights. Don't do anything rest that's what the word sabbath means well what is the sabbath now Ooh, we got a lot to say about that don't we let me give you some other things about the sabbath that's why paul couldn't have been going to the sabbath on because at the synagogue they can't keep the sabbath you got to have a let me put it this way you got to have a temple of God, which temple we are to keep the Sabbath, not a synagogue with a twisted law. Every time you see Paul going to the synagogue, it was to preach to the Pharisees and to gather together the next day with the apostles on the first day of the week to have an agape love feast. And at that agape love feast, they came together on the first day of the week since Jesus resurrected on that day. And we know that, goodness, I don't really want to go into all of it, but you look at the very end of the Gospels. That's where Jesus is crucified, isn't he? Very end of the Gospels. Look over here in Matthew. In verse 62. Now the next day, Jesus is crucified in this chapter. Now the next day that followed the day of preparation the chief priests and scribes came together into Pilate. This was the day of preparation. The day, the preparation is feminine gender. They called Friday the mother of the Sabbath. The and they called it the preparation day. Why is that? Because they had to cook their meals. They had to be preparing for the Sabbath. They had to get their tithes ready. They had to get a candle ready to light it. And that was called the Sabbath coming to light or the dawning of the Sabbath. The dawning of the Sabbath doesn't mean Saturday morning somewhere when the sun comes up. No. The dawning of the Sabbath, when the Sabbath draws on, that word means to resurrect or dawn, and that was the dawning of the lighting of the candle. And look over here at the end of, uh, end of Mark. Go over here in the 15th chapter of Mark. Jesus is being crucified... In verse chapter 15, verse 42. He's crucified all through here. Ninth hour, he cries, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In verse, 20, verse 34, and it says, verse 42, And now when the even was come, because it was the preparation, feminine gender, it was the Friday that they're going to bury him. He's crucified on Friday. That is the day before the Sabbath. He's being crucified on the day before the Sabbath, isn't he? I think that's what that says. Is that real hard to understand? Don't think so, is it? It was the preparation that is the day before the weekly Sabbath. He was crucified on Friday. That's what it says right here. And then over there in 
in the end of Luke. I won't read all of them. When he says here in uh, Luke, uh, which one I'm going to use? Uh, oh, wait, that's John. Okay. In verse 54. And Jesus is crucified here. We see Joseph of Arimathea going to try to get his body in 50 and 51. And then it says here, This man went to Pilate and begged the body of Jesus in verse 52. And he took it down and wrapped it in linen and laid it in a sepulcher that was hewn in stone where never man was laid. And that day was the preparation. And Sabbath drew on. That word drew on, epifasco, Fosco means to shine. It means to superimpose shining, and that's the lighting of the candle. The Uberic. I think that's the way you spell it. Something like that. Anyway, that's close enough. All right. And that was those three things. Preparing your food, tithing, and lighting the candle. And that's the drawing on of the Sabbath. It means to shine... The Sabbath didn't shine because of the dawning the next morning. The Sabbath began to shine when they lit the candle. And you couldn't turn on any lights or light any fire, and fire was the only way they had of having a light. That's why they had to light it before sundown on Friday. And the Sabbath drew on. And then over here, and it was the preparation, and the preparation is feminine gender. They only had one preparation in the week. That was the date. Some will say, well, they prepared for the Passover. The Passover, had they had to have a preparation before the Passover, even if it was on Thursday or Wednesday, but they did not call the day before the Passover the preparation. This is, is a definite article. It means there's only one preparation of the Jews. They called the day of preparation. That was Friday, what we call Friday. That was the preparation. And then when you go over here to John, the 19th chapter, John 19. In verse 31, the Jews therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was in high day. That means the day after the Sabbath was the first day of unleavened bread, which was a Sabbath. On that Sabbath day of that year, the Feast of Unleavened Bread started in the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread and the last day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread were Sabbaths. So you got, you got the Feast of Unleavened Bread being laid down right on top of the weekly Sabbath. That's a high day. That's what they call a high day. But you have to know something about the Feast of Unleavened Bread, don't you? Sure you do. And then he says, and then the soldiers come by to break his legs and as we said, they had the cross. They had the cross. They, they always had him carry the upright. They, they had him carry the cross piece. That was called a patibulum. Patibulum and the upright piece was called the stipes. They always buried the upright piece because... Hundreds of years before the people of Carthage tried to put it together like this, they'd drop a man in it and he'd come flying off the cross. He'd go fed and he'd go fly off the cross. So the Romans built it like so with a footstool right down here and then they had a notch up here and they'd carry the cross piece. They'd nail him to the cross piece. They didn't nail him in the midst of the palm of the hand. The palm, they said, went up to nearly the elbow. And between the radius and the ulna was considered the palm. They had to nail it through here. If they had nailed it through there, through the center of what we call the palm, the bones would have been broken, and the Passover lamb, not a bone could be broken. So when they hung him on this cross piece, they'd lift that up and twist it backwards. The Romans had, had made this a science to torture men. The cross was one of the worst ways of being tortured. They'd twist it backward, and then when he'd hang upon that cross, being twisted backward, 
his bones would pop out of joint and the Passover lamb had to be disjointed. No bone could be broken while they were eating it. So Jesus is the Passover. Well, nobody could be up on a cross on the Sabbath according to the Jews. That's what it says right here. So whenever he would breathe in, out of joint, they couldn't breathe out. They couldn't exhale. The way they exhaled, they would push themselves up. I thought that was a way to make it easy for them. That was a way to make it torturous, that little footstool down there. That was a way to torture them so they could exhale. But if they wanted to make the man suffocate, they'd go around and break his legs. And they'd already broken the legs of the men on both sides. And they came to Jesus. He's already dead. They couldn't have broken his legs. And the whole idea of breaking the legs was so no one would be hanging on a cross on the Sabbath. But he was dead already. Isn't that amazing? God caused him to die right before they are going to break his legs. But if they had broke his leg, he would not have been the Passover lamb. And the fact that they were going to break his legs means that the Sabbath day is at sundown on this day. <coughs> and then he says up there in verse 42, talking about where they took Jesus, anointed his body, and then, and then put him in that 41. Now in the place where he was crucified... There was a garden, and in the garden a new sepulcher wherein was never man yet laid. There laid they Jesus because of the Jews' preparation day. It actually says the preparation Jews' day. And there's only one day that the Jews call their preparation. And preparation, the preparation Jews, the preparation is Tain. Parascune. Tain. Para. S. K. U. N. E. The word is actually an ADA. In the. It's actually P. A. R. A. S. K. U. N. ADA. That's feminine. That's feminine. The aid is always feminine on the end of the word. And the preparation was the mother of the Sabbath. Jesus was absolutely, absolutely crucified on Friday. No doubt. The Bible says so right here. It says it in every one of the Gospels. Now, you've got to realize the synagogue wasn't keeping the Sabbath. They couldn't keep the Sabbath. They couldn't offer the offerings. They didn't have a brazen sea. They didn't have an altar. They didn't have an altar of incense. They, did, they couldn't set up a table of showbread. And all this was done on the Sabbath. So, you had to stay at home. Could be no cooking. You can't cause somebody else to contribute to cook for you in a restaurant. You'd be defiling the Sabbath that way, wouldn't you? Sure you would. Anyone who works on the Sabbath dies. If you drive your car, we're going to have to put you to death, okay? And you can't move a TV. You can't even slightly move it. If you've got one that's on rollers, and you want to point it to another chair, you can't do that on the Sabbath. You have to get Marianne to come over and move it for you. <laughs> uh, it's a Sabbath of rest. It's death to kindle a fire. Are you kindling fires when you're driving a car and, you, and you're causing each one of those cylinders that a fire is charging up in there? You can't do that. You couldn't ride a horse. You couldn't ride a donkey. You couldn't do anything. You sat in your house. You didn't go to church. You didn't let somebody else come cook a meal for you and pay them for it. You couldn't pay anybody anything on the Sabbath. That all had to be done the evening before the Sabbath. Call the Ubrick. People who call themselves Sabbath worshipers, they don't know what they're talking about. The Day of Atonement was a Sabbath. You're going to keep that too and offer a lamb without blemish? Passover was a Sabbath. You're going to offer a lamb. The Day of Atonement, you, was, you offered a goat. You're going to offer a goat without blemish? Where are you gonna get where are you gonna get a Ark of the Covenant? Oh, I forget that's your heart. Just lay one on top of your chest and offer it. P 
people don't know what they're talking about. There were 360 days in a Jewish calendar. You can't die. Divide 7 into 360, can you? You got three days left over. What are you going to do with those? The Jews had to shuffle the calendar so you ended up with the Sabbath not being a Sabbath. What are you going to do with that? Let me give you some other things. You had to fear God on the Sabbath. Reverence the sanctuary. You had to reverence this sanctuary right here. Where are you going to get one? We're the sanctuary of God for the spiritual Sabbath. The, in, the day of ingathering was a Sabbath. Day of atonement was a Sabbath. Pentecost was a Sabbath. That's 50 days after the Passover. Are you going to keep the Passover Sabbath? Sabbath means rest. Sabbat. S-A-B-O-T. Rest. And Israel was scattered because they didn't keep their Sabbaths. In 2 Chronicles 36, 21, Jeremiah 25 and 12, Jeremiah 29 and 10, Zechariah 1 and 12. God killed a young man in the 15th chapter of Numbers for gathering sticks on the Sabbath. Did God get, kill him for gathering sticks? Well, no. He killed him for his rebellion. God had just said, you've got to keep my Sabbath. And he says, God don't mind me picking up sticks. God says, kill that man. You can't pick up anything. You can't move anything. You can't drive your car. You certainly can't go to a church where preachers preaching. You got to stay at home in one spot. We don't want to keep it that way. Well, you're going to keep it. You're going to keep it right. They offered meat offerings and burnt offerings on the Sabbath. And they offered them on the altar here at the temple. They couldn't offer them over there in the synagogue. That was pagan. Synagogue was just as pagan as any other religions out there. That's who Jesus went after, the Pharisees. Let me give you a couple other things. No man or beast could work on the Sabbath. Otherwise, you'd die and you had to kill the beast, to kill the animal. You couldn't go out here and plow a garden on the Sabbath. You can't do any kind of work. Like I said, you can't pick up anything in your house. You can't even open a door. You've got to stay inside and lay on your bed or lay on the couch and do nothing. That's what it was for. There's no selling on the Sabbath. You can't have a garage sale on Saturday. Forget it. You cannot, you cannot go and buy something at a garage sale. You can't go to garage sales. First of all, you can't drive your car. You're lighting fires in those cylinders. And you're steering a wheel, which they couldn't do any kind of, anything that took two hands, they said you can't do. Besides pumping the gas. And Nehemiah went into a rage and a fury in the 13th chapter of Nehemiah because they were, the Jews were out there when he finished building Jerusalem. They're out there polluting the Sabbath. No pleasure on the Sabbath in Isaiah 58. None. Can't walk, watch college football. You can forget that. No basketball games. You can't go out and play touch football or baseball or anything. Much less watch TV or go to a movie on Sunday afternoon. No siree. No football. No driving your car. No, you can't, if you've got a convertible, you can't put the top down and drive around on Sunday. Sorry. Carry no burdens on the Sabbath. No loads out of your houses. Do not move a refrigerator or TV and do not move a residence or carry food anywhere. That's over in Jeremiah 17, 21, 22. In Ezekiel 20, 12 through 24, Sabbath for, for a sign. Sabbath is rest, isn't it? I meant to bring this out. Another sign to the unbeliever is the Sabbath. Sabbath rest was a sign. What is that? That's resting in the things that God's doing and that crucifies self, doesn't it? And that's a cross. And that's prepare you the way. And that is the resurrection, isn't it? Coming to life after dying. And the Pharisee, and look, at, look here, let me just give you one of these. Go over here to Matthew. Matthew. 12th chapter. 
the Sabbath, Sabbath was the big thing to the Pharisees of the synagogue and they couldn't even keep it. They couldn't keep it. How much time do I have, Mike? Uh, uh, I mean, I'll get it right in a minute. Tom, Mike's in somewhere going to a convention to help us. Where did I say he was going? Oh, Matthew 12. Matthew 12. Now they said, the Pharisees said, and I'm, I'm just kind of skimming the top of this. I hope you all understand. I'm throwing a rock because I'm trying to cover a lot of territory on what the Pharisees did before that they were Pharisees when they were the rabbis of the Babylonian synagogue. You, Jesus said, you've heard that it hath been said, but I didn't say that. Reference to their halakha. And let me tell you, you've heard it hath been said by the Baptist, accept Christ and pray the sinner's prayer. And Jesus did not say that. You've heard it hath been said by all the Protestants out here, thou shalt celebrate Christmas, the birthday of Jesus. And Jesus said, I didn't say that. You can take any false doctrine and, have, and that's nothing but a halakha. That's a traditionary law in America. Thou sh You've heard it hath been said by the Baptists in the Church of Christ, the Pentecostals, thou shalt dip people in water. Jesus said, I didn't say that. I'm telling you, I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how am I straight until it be accomplished? That In Luke 12, he says, that is a blood baptism. That's my death on the cross. A blood baptism was a martyrdom. He's washed us from our sins in his own blood, and there's one baptism. Ephesians 4 and 5. Now, Look here in Matthew 12. In the halakha, the traditionary law, they said, they said that no work could be done on the Sabbath. Well, that's true. But they also said that God created man on the sixth day. And you find that in Genesis, the first chapter. God created man on the sixth day, and they said there was a purpose in that because the Sabbath was so holy the seventh day that God created him on the sixth day to put him in subjection to the Sabbath. That's what the Jews said in their halakha. And Jesus said the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. That was a complete contradiction to their halakha and their haggadah. He said, that's not true. He said, the Sabbath was made to give man rest. Man wasn't made on the sixth day to put in subjection to the Sabbath so he could give reverence to the seventh day. The seventh day was to give him rest. Now I hear and understand, some have told me and some nurses, and I've read it, that man's heart slows down every seven days so he can rest. I went for years without resting. And that made my body very ill. Not ill back then, but ill even today. I've got pretty good health for a man at my age in his 70s, but I would have been a lot healthier if I hadn't have stressed out and stressed my life to the hill back then. I believe a lot of the damage was done years ago. I never rested, and rest is the Sabbath. We enter into God's rest by believing Him. The Sabbath is every day. We don't believe the Saturday was, that Sabbath was switched from Saturday to Sunday. When God blotted out the handwriting of ordinances, all the rituals of the temple were blotted out, even the Sabbath day rituals. Does God have a Sabbath? He says, you enter into my rest by believing that everything is going on around you is of me. You have to believe in predestination in order to understand the spiritual Sabbath. I'll go into that next week the spiritual Sabbath. People don't have any idea about it. You can't keep all these things on the Sabbath, can you? The big thing that Jesus did, the greatest point of the Halakha and the God of the Jews was their Sabbath, yet they couldn't even keep it in a synagogue. They couldn't keep it. Look here. He says... Verse 5, Or yet have you not read in the law how that on the Sabbath days the priest in the temple 
profane the Sabbath and are blameless? But I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple and he's greater than the Sabbath. <coughs> but if ye have known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not ritual. That word sacrifice is talking about sacrifices they offered at the temple. <coughs> I don't want sacrifices. I don't want rituals. All those rituals of the temple, they were all pointing to Christ. When they'd offer seven lambs and they'd offer <coughs> a goat <coughs> and bullocks <coughs> to cleanse the priesthood and bullocks to cleanse the temple, they all pointed to Christ. Let's continue reading here. You would not have condemned the guiltless, for the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath, of the Sabbath day. The Jews said in their halakha when Messiah came that he would be Lord of the Sabbath and could dispense with it as he pleased. And who is this, this speaking here? That's Jesus. Jesus said, I am the Son of Man. I am Lord of the Sabbath. I'll do with it as I please. I've got so much to go with this. Let me give you some other things here. Let's back up. Do I have any time? Back up to Matthew, the fifth chapter. Matthew 5. <coughs> Let me move some of this right here. I got so much on this, I wish I could get to all of it, but I have a hard time doing it. All right. Let's go back to Matthew, the fifth chapter. When Jesus said, Except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, in verse 20, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. And then he said, You've heard it, it hath been said. That's a direct reference to their halakha. Their halakha in the synagogue. And then he says, but I say. I've already gone through all these and I'll come back and go through them. When he says, you've heard it, it hath been said, thou shalt not kill, whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment, which means tribunal. The tribunal in Israel was the Sanhedrin, the 70 judges of Israel. Well, they said that you could kill a Gentile who wasn't a believer and suffer no and suffer nothing for it. And Jesus is saying, I didn't say that. But I say, when he's saying, but I say, he's saying, I'm the God who was on the mountain with Moses. Here's what I said. Here's what I meant. we got a land full of halakha. Every church I know of. Here's what I said, that whosoever is angry with his brother without cause, shall be in the danger of the judgment of God, not just the tribunal at Jerusalem. Crisis is the word, K-R-I-S-I-S. We get the word crema, K-R-I-M-A, which is we get our word crime from that. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, which means you empty-headed fool, shall be in danger of the council at the Sanhedrin. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool shall be in danger of hell fire. Now, my mother in law used to say, Call a man a fool, you go, go to hell. That's not what he's talking about. Who is he talking to? He's talking to the blessed ones. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are they that mourn. Blessed are they, those that are meek. Blessed are they which hunger and thirst after righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. Verse 8 Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Great peace have they that love thy law. Nothing shall offend them. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you in all matter of evil against you falsely for my sake. He says, if anyone says to you blessed ones that are on the mountain with me, if they say you're a fool for being pure in heart, meek, poor in spirit, he says, they're in danger of hell fire. He's talking about the Pharisees 
to the blessed ones. You see that? <laughs> you can't yank a verse out of context. <coughs> I've heard so many people, could call a man a fool. Jesus said men are fools that don't believe him. The word fool is morose. We get our word moron from that. It means an empty-headed simpleton. But they're supposed to be fools because God is blind to them. Goodness. I'm about out of time and i got so many more things I want to say. I just don't have time to say them all. I wanted to... I can't get into that. All the way through here, all through here, he says, you've heard that it hath been said by the Pharisees when they were the rabbis of the Babylonian synagogue. Why would Paul go to the synagogue when Jesus starts off rebuking the Pharisees of the Babylonian synagogue? He goes to the Babylonian synagogue and the, the synagogue in Jerusalem is a Babylonian synagogue. It was created in Babylon. It wasn't created in Israel. And it was called the synagogue, the great synagogue of Babylon. And they said it was more holy than the temple. Why would Paul go to a place with all this corruption to worship God? Why would I go to the big Baptist church or the big church of Christ to worship God? I wouldn't. I'd go in there to correct them for their lies. That's the only reason Paul was going in there. Gosh, I've got so many things here. Any time left? One minute. One minute. And he says down here, and I'm going to go into this. Down here in verse, you've heard that it hath been said, thou shalt not commit adultery in verse 27. Now most people will say, committing adultery is with a married woman. And here's what Jesus says. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a single woman or a married woman, it says a woman, that means single or married, to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. He says there's adultery. And it's when you lust after a woman, married or single. Ooh, we. Have we done that? Men. Now, somebody want to raise your hand there and lie? Or you want to lie and say, I have never done that? And then he says, if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out. Isn't that what you look upon a woman with? To lust after a man? He's saying, whatever part of you, he's not talking about pulling your literal eye out, whatever spiritual part of you that goes after sin, he says, I'm harder than the Pharisees ever thought they could be. They twisted the word of God in this halakha. They twisted, they called it the targum. That was the twisting. There was nothing good about the synagogue. There never has been, never will be. It's a Babylonian system. And that's what Jesus was attacking, was the system of the synagogue. When the Bible speaks of the synagogue of Satan, in the second chapter of Revelation, every synagogue was the synagogue of Satan. You see what I'm saying? People thinking, synagogue of Satan means that's where they worship Satan. No, 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 no. That's where the Pharisees were. When the Bible speaks of Satan's synagogue in Revelation 2, it's talking about every synagogue that was started in Babylon. I've run out of time. I'll come back. When I come back, I'll go into verse 31, and I'm going to take you through Paul going to the synagogues and how they attacked him every time he went in. He didn't go there to worship. Don't you think that? He hated those people in the synagogue. He knew that's where he could catch them. Where can we find wicked, evil men? Are we willing to go there? Whew. Up the street? Goodness, Paul was ready to be thrown in jail. If he was here today, he's got a lot more guts than all of us have. He would go up here to the Devil's Broadcasting Network, DBN, and he would wear them out standing on their front steps and they'd call the police and have him put in jail. And people would call him a nut. There's a nut out there in front of the, in front of the auditorium at TVN. Wouldn't he? If Jonah was here, he'd be doing the same thing. 
going up to the big Baptist church. If Nehemiah was here, goodness gracious alive, he wouldn't put up with nothing, would he? And he'd come out there by the gate of the temple. He said, if you don't get away from there, I'm going to come lay hands on you. He didn't mean I'm going to pray for you. And he went down there, grabbed the Jews' beards, yanked their beards out and (laughs) chased one of them away from the gate. (coughs) They were out there selling on the Sabbath. (coughs) He said, we've been carried into captivity because of this and you're out here doing it over again. He pulled their beards out. He chased them. He hit them. (coughs) If Nehemiah was here, you you Baptists and Pentecostals and Charismatics and Church of Christ... Better be glad he's not here because he'd be up there dragging you out of your pulpits on Sunday morning, kicking off the front steps. Said, don't ever come back here. That's what he'd be doing. What a man. Read the 13th chapter of Nehemiah. He was, he's one of my heroes. Him and Jeremiah, I think, are two of my greatest heroes of the Bible. I love Nehemiah. If you think I'm angry, Read the 13th chapter of Nehemiah and see if you think he was angry. Israel was out there and he just finished building Jerusalem. Just finished. He had gotten the word from from, uh, Artaxerxes 12 years before that he could build the city. He built it and just as soon as he gets the city built, now the reason they're off in captivity is because they were were, uh, polluting the Sabbath, violating the Sabbath, going after other gods. As soon as it gets the Jerusalem rebuilt, they all come out on the Sabbath and bring out their wares to sell on the Sabbath. He says, what in the world are you doing? He comes down and starts hitting them, pulling their beards out. They had big beards. <laughs> Yanking them out, going, get out of here! Punching them. You think I'm too hard. Try to am I. I wish I had the guts that he's got. What a man. He's truly one of the great men of God that's ever lived. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for truth. Thank you for helping us to understand this book. Lord, we pray that you'll cause us to mature in the faith. God will glorify you and praise you for all things. We pray that you'll strengthen us, mature the flock, God, we pray you open up many doors for this ministry and we'll keep preaching. We'll praise you for all things. In Christ's name, amen. (coughs) Now that's the truth. Deal with it. So many people think because Paul went to synagogue on the Sabbath. I've had many people tell me that. Well, he would not serve God and went to worship on the Sabbath day. No, he didn't go to worship. It's kind of like going into the camp of the enemy. That's what he did. So I'll come after you guys. He was gutsy. What's that do? Guts. What are you doing? Like court and word K-R-I-M-A. Oh, it does? Who got his crime? Get nothing to the Crimen.
I don't believe some of the things these people said. I don't believe Last week they had what they call a Seda, right? Yeah. I call it plain church. Yeah. This is what they do. Well, it's Seder is a part of it. That's the Passover. Yeah, but the way they're doing it. And the way they're doing it is not the Passover. They don't have a temple. They don't have a a lamb without blemish. They don't play church. And right. the lamb is Christ. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. this, and this is what I show them. Well, I mean, it might be chilly. I said, y'all deny him. Yeah, that's but right. you don't recognize oh, the importance oh, that's been placed oh, yeah. on him. That's you know, right. I mean, it's just <laughs> self-evident. <laughs> they don't want to know. They don't want to know. But let me tell you what she told me. I was telling her about history and why I didn't hear much more because history is a lie. Yeah. Right. Well, but she's yeah, but she's trying to tell me that I should believe the history. Okay. Hey, buddy, the history books. I told crazy. her that. I showed her where that's they crazy. Lie. But no, you didn't. You let me finish. With it. But so when I was telling her something about the Bible, she said, "Well, you can't believe everything in the Bible." I said, "But I should believe everything in your history books." Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Is she a Jew? She's a Jew. Say, are you Jew? Should, should I believe everything in the Talmud? Should I believe everything in your Jewish holy book? Yeah. You know, like I say, I, I was in a maze at what she didn't know. You know, confessing to yeah. being what she confessed. They don't know anything. They don't. They really don't. You know. Yeah. And I say, I have to catch you myself. So that I don't Please. argue the point because I said they don't know and they really don't want to know and I can sit here and talk until I'm blue in the face but she won't hear me. The they, unless God gives them an ear to hear, they they don't don't hear. Don't waste your time. Exactly. I wouldn't talk to them all the time. I do. I'm sorry. I changed the subject and walk away. <laughs> exactly. You're not going to. You're not going to reach them without ears to hear. Right, right. You know? Yeah. And it's a waste of time. It takes ears to hear. Yep. It's a waste of time and energy. And I say, that's what it is. And I often say that God would not be pleased if I argue with him. Yeah. I let him know. He, he won't. Just leave him alone. I know he won't. Tell the truth and walk away. Exactly. That's what you do. That's exactly what I do. Leave them alone. I couldn't you get on with that. You can't make people release. No. I shouldn't do that. I give people truth and walk away. Yeah. But I just what you ought to do is tell some of the truth. Look, if Jesus is God and if he is true, you can make how you been? Oh, well, you know, it's like I say. And he said he was God. He said, be who Abraham was. I am. Yeah. But yeah. well, see, that's what she's telling me. What is she telling me? You can't believe everything you read. You know what I'm saying? I said, but I should believe your history. Right. Yeah. You know? Oh, I'm right here. We have an extra key for the doors. So why don't just put one? I'd have to give them one. Okay. Why is that? So I can have a door. Okay. All right. I'll get you one. Yeah. I don't have one with me. All I was in LA for 18 years. But anyway, I'm glad I made it tonight. I was, I've been trying to make it for now. 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 Yeah. Y'all know Tony. Yeah. Yeah. Tony. Yeah. Oh, I don't think he's mad. This is Connie. Hi, nice to meet you. This is Shelby. You know yeah. Shelby? Yeah. yeah. It's Kobe here. Well, my This is Connie's husband. This is Dwayne. She's been with us for a long time. She's not able to come because she's a caregiver. She has to stay with the lady 24 hours a day. She wants to be here all the time, but she's not able to. They keep dying on her, and she goes and gets another one. Yeah. Don't they? Yeah. But now I'm at the Blake for it, but still. She believes the truth. When I Come. ask the boss to give me some time, they tell me they can't spare. Yeah. So bad you got this tonight. You got you one. Yeah. Well. I do all what he gives me. She believes these truths, don't she? Yeah. Yeah. She believes them. Yeah. I thank the Lord for his things. That's right. And a mouth that speaks boldly. Yeah. She talks, she, the people she 
Let's see, give the caregiver boys a lot of energy. Yes. Yes. So she's, so she's out there with a bunch of lock on people. Oh, they don't have a clue. They don't have a clue. Yeah. 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 They don't have a clue. 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 They don't have a I tell you that, you know, I, I, the simplicity of it, this is my favorite How do you deny him? I said, what year is it? I said, and you recognize that the year is based on the birth of this man. You know, how do you deny, you know, the importance? They want to say 2013, but where'd you get that? Yeah. That's good thing. Because I asked, I said, when you sign your check, what date do you put on? <laughs> you know, I said that right there, as uh, Ricky Ricardo would say, that's self-explanatory. 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 And then I have to walk away. I then have to walk away. It's just, well, well, that's what you're up against when you're know, a bunch of old Jews. But it's hard being surrounded by that kind <laughs> so of ignorance. You know, in, in other words, her daughter wears a shirt about being a Jewish mom. And I recognize what it means to be a Jewish mom. You're never wrong. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. But you're wrong all the time. You know what I'm saying? But you feel like you're never wrong. You know? And I mean, every day I have to go to that. You know? But God is, you know, I have to constantly remember that these people don't have ears to hear. And he didn't give it to me. You know, and, um, you know, my, my place here is to do what I'm supposed to do. To obtain what I'm going to obtain. To do what I need to do with it. You know, and it's, and it's just that simple. But I still, every now and then, I can't resist. I can't resist when I hear wrong to correct it. Do you, mean, do you say some real pointed things to some of those Jewish ladies? But it's like I told you a minute ago, when I tell them the truth, she'll tell me, well, you can't believe everything you believe when you read in the Bible. I said, oh, really? The reason why you don't believe a lot of it is because it's been, uh, a lot has been lost in translation. But I know how to take it back with what it's really saying, you know, and I know how to interpret, you know, uh, um, what's going on, you know, and the Holy Spirit gives me the ability to be able to discern what's right and what's wrong. In this word, you know, it's like the light bulb goes on and says, this is correct, you know. Well, everybody that's a believer recognizes the truth. Truth, right. They know it's that's true. It's right. like I told my auntie the other day, I said, Pastor, say, this is sheep food and goats on me. You know, so if you're eager to understand, did you tell I your aunt her, that? Then? I sent her a concordance class. So you tell her if she's a sheep, she'll be Yeah, exactly. That's what I was telling her. And I was showing her about the Bible and what got lost in translation, like what it says in goodness and mercy shall follow me. All the days of my life, the word follow being, I think, is Padah. But in taking it to the 23rd Psalm, what it's saying is it will pursue you has to overtake you. Yeah. So it's not just the, that uh, word follow. You know, it's, it more, in, it's more in depth than that. Uh, follow. It's just a shallow, it's a shallow word. Yeah. You know, and it's really, you know, in, in other words, what it's saying that goodness and mercy is not going to be satisfied just following us. You know what I'm saying? It's not going to be satisfied completely. Overcome. Oh, exactly. And that you know, takes a long time. But that's a yeah, a lifetime. It takes a lifetime. And that's so good to know. You know, it's been good 
Yes, you know. I, I'm just saying the depth of that. You know. How long have you been coming out to Blue Ridge Grace and Truth? I can't remember. Ten or twelve years. When she gets her DVDs. Yeah. Yeah. Is it fun? I live, breathe, and eat on the stand up. Oh, and I pass them. Do you play them in the houses of some of those Jewish people? No, but I pass them out to the fellow caregivers. You know, because the Jewish people, they, I doubt strongly. I doubt they would. You know, because they half of them don't want to hear the comments. But the other day, one of them, I told her, she said, Tony, you need a new Bible. I said, well, thank you, you know. She noticed mine was kind of worn out. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But, what, but this is the same one that told me, well, uh, you can't believe everything's in the Bible. And then she turned around and said that. I said, well, somewhere in there, I might be getting the through. Yeah, but I'm saying, but you know, still, I'm saying somewhere in there, I might be getting through. Because see, on the hardest surface of granite and steel, the constant drifting of water will be right right. So if I keep on saying what I'm saying long enough, some of it's going to be a little bit of a change. I had somebody come here from L.A. sat right here. And he said, he talked to me. You talk to him. You get all that, don't you? And he said, He'd been along, he came from the wealthy Jewish family. Half of them were crooks. Were crooks. That's it. And he said, I've learned more listening to this man than all the years of going having to go to the synagogue. Yeah. Maybe not go back. Well, Jesus, yeah. he was a holy man. That's it. Yeah. I said, yeah. don't say that. Okay. Make it to yourself. Just agree. Yeah. You're stupid. But he learned more here listening to him for an hour and a half. Right. He yeah. he said, that's just a waste. That's not really a compliment. Yeah. I mean, to say you learn more here an hour and a half than you learned it back in, in 20 years. I mean, they don't say anything. They learned, he learned a lie, but they didn't even lie well, to him. The thing is, they're not saying anything. <laughs> like yeah. I never considered that a compliment. Yeah. But it's like the people... They did a bad job lying. That's not saying I 